this video, I'm going to be building an awesome white themed gaming PC inside of NZXT's brand new H9 PC case. I'll be running you through all the parts that make this build possible, showing you guys how to put it together and detailing some of the struggles we have along the way. Got no idea what this is before covering off performance at the end so you can see exactly how this thing stacks up in all the latest titles. Let's do this. things off by looking at the PC case first of all, as this is perhaps one of the most interesting parts of the build. NZXT's new H9 Elite looks to provide a better, more expensive option than their H7, a case that we absolutely love by the way, and obviously takes a few design cues from the Li and Li O11D XL, to a degree the Hype Y60 new Y40, and a few other of these sort of fish tank glass framed cases we've seen as of late. But NZXT often do a very good job of executing on these ideas and hopefully the H9 will be a similar story. I'm going to take this thing out the box so we can take a closer look. Here it is. Now the first thing that's going to strike you about this case, apart from how heavy it weighs an absolute ton, is that the back is fully perforated giving loads and loads of scope for great airflow. Let's take that off. I think it should be tallest. It is indeed. This sort of thumb screw thing is only really to secure it in shipping and make sure that the tallest mechanism doesn't fail essentially. Then at the top there's this nice glass panel which shows into the case. Whoa hello. I thought it was just the glass that's going to come off. It turns out it's this other perforated strip and the IO cover too. Talking of IO by the way you've got a USB-C 3.1 Gen 2, two USB-A's of the 3 variety, a power reset button and of course the HD audio jack. Move around to the front of the case and if I just pull out this accessory box I think I might need to take the other panels off before pulling out the accessory box. So the glass ones here, as you can see, there are one at the front, one at the side, and they join perfectly. So there's a completely frameless aesthetic like you would find with the Hype Y60. Another thumb screw. Oh, yes. Boom. Nice. Come on. Out you get. Yes. Tidy. There we go. Now this comes out, and it looks to me like the front panel, while removable, you need screws, which implies that NZXD don't really want you or need you to remove that panel. This is a case that's obviously all about that chimney airflow design. So we're bringing air in from basically the front or the side. Obviously the front's all glass, so it's going to be the side rear panel and from the bottom and then using the principle that hot air rises, exhaust out the back and out the top. These are NZXT's new dual ring RGB fans. Normally with a traditional fan, if it's backwards, aka facing away from you, it looks really ugly. There's a label and there's no RGB. That's fixed. And NZXT also pinged over their F140R duos. So they're calling these the duo range, which I'm probably going to pop either in the bottom or in the top. Not sure yet. Finally, to wrap things up, there's also this slightly peculiar Perspex plastic toolless radiator design. Not really sure what that's all about, but I'm, I guess we'll find out a bit later. And of course, this one is the white colorway where a black is also available. I'll link a full review to this in the cards now over on geekawatt.com. Anyway, though, that's the case. What kind of hardware are we going to pop in it? Well, the Core i5 13600K or alternatively the 13700 100K if you want to do a bit of streaming, video editing, more productivity oriented tasks alongside an NZXT N7 Z690. Don't worry, this board will work with 13th gen chips with an easy BIOS flashback, which you can do using the integrated USB port. Or alternatively, NZXT have got a more expensive new Z790 option, which will work well too. Intel's 13th gen is, well, I mean, frankly, a no brainer at the moment. The i5 punches well above its weight. Never before would I recommend an i5 in a high-end gaming PC, but now you simply don't need anything more than that for gaming. We've been stupidly impressed with the quality of Intel's new chips, and of course with their new budget-friendly B760 chipset now out as well, the possibilities really are endless. Aesthetically, these boards are a perfect fit for the case. You get this really cool kind of metal white shielding all over the board, which basically just acts as like a cover for all of the components and the black PCB underneath. What's more, it also supports DDR4 memory, which is quite a piece cheaper than DDR5 and isn't 
really going to sacrifice any performance. The 13th gen platform is just an absolute win-win for so many people, and it's also been nice to see NZXT venture into the motherboard market. Memory or RAM is next up, a 32 gig kit comprised of two 16 gigabyte DIMMs of Corsair's Vengeance RGB Pro will do the business nicely. Second and fourth slots in this board and the white aesthetic with a hint of RGB matches perfectly with what I've opted to go for in this system. Storage will be provided by a two terabyte WD Black SN850X. I'm going to be honest with you, I splurged on this component just a little bit, but I want really quick storage for my build. And if you do, a drive like this will be great. I'll link alternative Gen 4 and Gen 3 options in the cards now. Make sure you get something with read and write speeds of over three gigabytes a second for this build. Any less than that, you may start to see bottlenecking on the graphics and the CPU we've opted to go for. And the last thing you want to do is spend thousands on a PC only for storage to be the bottleneck. Once all those bits and pieces are in the motherboard, it's pretty much ready to go. There is one thing I do want to do at this stage, and that's adding some mounting hardware around the processor for the cooler in this build, which is also from NZXT, their Kraken Z73. It's 360 mils, so it should fit, I think, at the top of the case and brings its own RGB fans. So maybe we could have the cooler fans at the top, the extra fans I bought at the bottom, and have a whole big airflow extravaganza. It's kind of kind of what I'm going for. So it's just this back plate which needs to go on. It's flexible and the corners move to fit in the CPU kind of socket. And then the posts that come with it, these male to male posts are going to screw on top and create basically the foundation for the cooler to go onto later. Lovely jubbly. And then in theory, this should slide in nice and easily. It matches well. Look at that. Well, hey, now you do need to screw it in. You can't just leave it floating there. It might fall over. But with a few screws later, that's looking amazing already. And there we go. So that's basically the final screw. If it wants to actually go in, get in, screw, screw into place. Nice. And now if you give the motherboard a wiggle, that is not going anywhere. Obviously, we did the CPU cooler prep a minute ago. I'm going to finish that work off now by adding the cooler into the top. And to do so, I've sort of got to figure out what on earth this plastic thing at the top actually is. So take a couple of the screws out. Are they, they kind of captive screws? Let me see if I can get you guys a better view. Got no idea what this is. Oh, hello. Oh, I'm not really sure what the plastic frame is for. I don't, I don't know, actually. What is the plastic frame for? The plastic frame is to make the radiator look like it's floating. Either way, though, I think I'm going to pop the radiator on the bottom with the included fans underneath to pull air through. So in order to do that, I think fans go on the radiator first of all. Uh, so three fans, one at the top, one in the middle, and one along the bottom. And then the completed radiator unit needs to go onto this bracket a little something like this. I'm, I'm going to have to sort of hold it, I think, while it gets screwed in. Or, here's an idea, I can put it on the end of the table. Look at me go. Oh, I'm too clever. 2023 is a year of knowledge for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn so much and become a better PC, but I'll be quiet now and screw this in. Then it's a case of mounting the water block, a drop of thermal paste on the processor. Maybe I've made a mess of that, but it's fine. As long as you don't overload it too much, you're not going to have too many problems. Then it's the water block, which is just going to sit over those posts we installed a bit earlier. So let me pull all of that cable mess out of the way so we're not getting that stuck in all the thermal paste and making a more of a mess. Whack the cooler on. In theory, he's on. Or she, I mean, it could be either. Then thumb screw is just going to pop onto each corner. My advice my gigawatt top tip for this bit of the build is to just put on each one very loosely to begin with as that will just hold the cooler in and stop it from actually falling off which when your PC is sort of upright like this is perhaps the thing that you want to avoid most so each of these is going to thread loosely into place then you can finish them off with a screwdriver pretty much all of the build you just want to use a normal hand tightened Phillips head anything electrical or cordless drill or anything like that it's just going to over torque them they don't need to be that tight even these ones could be tightened with just your thumbs if you like but I find a screwdriver does a better job on the whole as you would expect. You can actually grab it and give it a shake and the whole build should move and in my case the whole desk has moved meaning that it's definitely installed A-OK -okay. and I'll wire that all up later on. The next component is probably going to be the most controversial part of this gaming PC and that is of course the graphics card. Now this GPU has well it's received some heat over the last little bit and to be honest with you it kind of deserves it but there are positives to the 4070 Ti. It is the cheapest next gen card available 
available and at a $799 MSRP, providing we can actually find cards for that price. Latest price and availability will be linked below as always. It's not exactly cheap, but it's hardly an $1,000 or a $1,200 card like the 7900 XDX and 4080 12 gig. 16 gig. 4080 16 gig. Very confusing. 47 TTI has got 12 gigs of video memory and it performs about on par, slightly better in our testing than the 3090 Ti. While this might not be quite as lofty as some of Nvidia's claims, it is a lot cheaper than both what a 3090 Ti cost at launch and more importantly what it costs now. And it also beats out in most instances the 6950 XT, which is more expensive than this card. So it's not all negative. And if you want the next gen DLSS 3 improved ray tracing and great solid rasterization performance, you haven't really got many better choices for now at least than the 4070 Ti. This one is the MSI Supreme model. Actually, the Supreme X model to be precise. It's got the legendary MSI Supreme cooler, really, really nice design, bit of RGB, PCI Gen 5 connector, and gorgeous integrated backplate that look, I mean, plainly fantastic. In order to install the GPU, I could do things the simple way and just slot it in like a normal person. But instead, I'm going to try this vertical GPU mount that NZXT sent out ages ago. The only complication is that it's got this little foot on the bottom, which you can wind out and holds onto the bottom of the case, normally where your power supply shield would be to add integrity. However, this case has got a massive gap at the bottom where fans are going to go. So this might not work, but as with all things in life, I'm a trier. I'm going to give it a go. And the worst case, we have to go back to a traditional orientation. But I think probably going to be okay. And it's white, so it matches the build. The way it works is you take out pretty much, I think, all of the existing lanes. Yes, every single one of the existing PCI lanes. Put this in its place and it supports triple slot graphics cards. In our 4070 Ti is all good to go. And with plenty of clearance at the front, we should be fine for airflow too. If anything, this should be better for airflow than the other way around. So I think this is going to be all right. I'm a bit worried about when we put the weight on the mount and it's sagging. But for now, NZXT, that seems pretty solid. And I'm sure they've probably got an amended vertical mount that actually has a support that works. But for now, let's pop that into place. Lovely stuff. Put that in there. Clip her in. It is in. And importantly, it fits. It looks very good. And it's not really, especially once I've screwed it in, drooping all that much. Let me fasten this thing into place. I think the only complication is that the power supply I've gone for, which I'll be installing next, the NZXT C750, doesn't have a PCI Gen 5 connection, or not the version I have, but the dongle should hide away nicely just behind the graphics card. I'm also going to pop in some PSU cable extensions as well at this stage. And if you'd like to see a full cables and wiring guide, you can find one of those over on our website in the cards section now. Oh my goodness, this thing looks incredible. I cannot wait until this is powered up. So what on earth are we waiting for? I'll rejoin you in a minute for the benchmarks. But first, let's turn this thing on and roll that epic montage. The big question that I need to answer is just how well this system performs. Well, we've put it through its paces in a range of titles from Warzone 2 to Modern Warfare 2 to Apex, Fortnite, and even F1 2022. So let's take a look, shall we? In Spider-Man Miles Morales to start off with, we tested at 1440p, very high settings, with DLSS enabled and set to performance and NVIDIA frame generation enabled. 155 frames per second was the outcome, something I thought was actually very, very impressive given this graphics card's position positioning and showing that it's more than capable for gaming at 1440p and of course 4k. Warzone 2 at high settings with DLSS once again set to quality uh, also delivered good results 106 frames per second to be precise and this was pretty impressive. I was slightly surprised that our next title COD's Modern Warfare 2 uh, as it's a very similar game basically the same game underneath to Warzone 2 but here we got 133 fps so 20 to 30 more frames per second. 1440p high with DLSS set to quality or one once again, the settings used. Crank DLSS to performance and your image quality will suffer, but the frame rate could be pushed further. Fortnite at 1080p competitive also delivered strong results. 310 FPS on average to be precise, with all the settings tuned down to low, except the render distance, which was set to far for maximum frame rate. Apex Legends, we did a couple of tests, first at 1440p high, pulling in 165 FPS on average, while jumping up to 4K resolution, only reduced the frame rate to 121. So you've either got 
165 or 121 FPS on average, depending on what resolution you'd like to play. Finally, I also tested out a bit of Formula 1 2022 here at 1440p ultra high with DLSS set to quality once again. Uh, DLSS 3 in this case and 224 FPS was the flavour of the day. Frame rates reduced dramatically at 4K and I'd recommend for that reason sticking with 1440p on this GPU. All the parts mentioned today will as ever be linked at the affiliate links below. Thanks for tuning in and as always we'll see you in the next one.